And if they can kill him, then what can they do to me? And we're rolling. What's up, Jose? What's up, bud? Thanks for being here, brother. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate All right. it. Well, let's just get to it, man. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, what your name is, uh, um, branch of service, years served, the job you did, and uh, the rank you got out as, if you can remember all that. <laughs> My name is Jose Gasca. I served in the United States Marine Corps from 1999 to 2003. I was uh, 0311 Infantry. I was 8152 and 8154, which is uh, security forces as well as a uh, close quarters battle. And I got out as a corporal E4. Right on, man. Um, let's just uh, start off to talk to me a little bit about um, where you're from, where you're born, and uh, where you were raised, what your childhood upbringing was like. All right. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles in the housing projects of uh, Normont Terrence Housing Projects. Uh, my childhood. Like, honestly, uh, a lot of Hispanic kids back in the 80s. I grew up in a single uh, parent home. My mom raised me, my two older brothers, and a little sister. Um, so, obviously, growing up in housing projects in the middle of the crack epidemic was, uh, was tough on her, I'm sure. I and mean, we've had uh, really good dis discussions uh, ever since. But uh, she was a hardworking lady, hard nosed. Um, she, she cleaned houses for a living. Uh, so we kind of had to kind of raise each other. My older brother, I see a lot as a, as a father. He, uh, looked after us. Um, I was a small kid. I, I walked my sister to school, picked her up from school. You know, we learned how to cook at a very early age, take care of each other. Uh, you know, your basic egg plates and bean plates and tortilla plates is, is kind of how we got through uh, as a child. Um, so, yeah, man, that's that was basically my upbringing in L.A. in, in the early 80s. Uh, growing up in the projects like that, um, was there any peer pressure to, to, to become part of that culture to maybe get jumped into a gang or anything? Um, yeah, so in L.A., it's, even to this day, gangs are... are uh, or, uh, it's part of the culture here. Um, thankfully, me, I, I never joined a gang. I think uh, having my brother around was a big help. I had family members who were part of the gang that I grew up in in the town I grew up in. But um, obviously, they didn't want us to join gangs, so they, they were a big help in uh, steering us away from that. But, I mean, it doesn't mean you just get to say, oh, I don't want to join a gang, and, and that's that. So there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of fights growing up, a lot of backing up your friends, uh, things you learn from an, from an early age that, you know, obviously we're going to get into military here in a second, but uh, that you bring into the military. You, you don't leave your mates behind. Um, so, yeah, there was, there was a lot of scraps growing up. I, yeah. I'm growing up to be a good fighter. Well, because, you know, growing up like that, it's... Uh, um, the 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 rival neighborhoods you know get to know you from being from that neighborhood and it doesn't really matter whether you got jumped in or not right you're you're, you're catching the beef for that right yeah they they know where you're from instinctively uh they know where you're walking towards and uh so yeah either sometimes you got to stand your ground and and fight and there's a lot of other times to be honest i'm not ashamed to say it you know it's time to go yeah it's me and one guy and four dudes getting out of the car, uh, that's the time to go. So uh, yeah. <laughs> we beat feet, man. We, you learn your alleys and your fences and what what yards have dogs and what which yards don't. I mean, it's your neighborhood, so you know it better than the guys who are coming in. But, uh, yeah, it was a lot of that growing up, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so what inspired you to, to join the military? Uh, again, for me, I, I see my older brother as, as my father, um, and as a hero, to be honest. Um, so he was a Marine. He joined the Marines back in uh, 1987. And uh, once he went in and got to see him, you know, doing his thing, I was like, man, that's cool. And, and coming from uh, a place that's economically impoverished, um, I knew my mom wasn't going to be able to pay for college. So short of having a full scholarship for sport, um, 
at an early age, I knew that if I wanted to get out of this place, being the neighborhood, uh, it would have to be something, something to do with the military. Uh, is there a specific uh, reason why you chose the Marines? My brother was a Marine. Mm. So uh, him being your hero, I couldn't see myself going anywhere else. So uh, yeah, the Marine Corps was for me. Right. Um, where'd you go to boot camp? I went to boot camp in uh, San Diego. It was, I actually went two days before my uh, 18th birthday. Mm. So I still remember it. Talk to me a little bit about that. What was it like, um, you know, transitioning into a, a military environment for you? So, you know, growing up on the rough side of the tracks, I was, you know, you're pretty rough nosed. So um, once I went in there, I kind of had that chip on my shoulder. But like most uh, veterans and especially Marines will know that that means absolutely nothing in there. They, they knock that thing off really quick. So uh, I was used to the yelling and, and you know, and the discipline. My, ma my mom ran a, a pretty tough household. Um, but being in there, I, I kind of felt, it's kind of, kind of weird to say, but I, I was at home. You know, I was used to it. I knew that I was there to better myself. My brother being a Marine was like, hey, you go there and you give it 110%. So I was ready to work. Um, where'd you go from boot camp? So from boot camp, once I got out, I went to School of Infantry. And then from there, uh, I was able to, to join the Fleet Anti-Terror Security Team Company, which is FAST Team for short out of uh, Virginia, um, out of Security Force School, though it's also in Virginia, I got sent to a uh, first fast company, but I was only there for like a month because, uh, you know, Marine Corps does what it wants. So they felt that myself and six others were better off going to second fast company, which is stationed out of Yorktown, Virginia. And then uh, I jumped in right with them in a spin up and, uh, you know, I deployed about six months later. What was uh, what what's Fast Company all about? Just you know, just talk to me a little bit about that. What's the what what are the what are the duties of a Fast Company? Right. right. So uh, a Fast Team is basically um, they they add strength to a security force that's already in place. So we're forward deployed. So we're very deployable. We're self uh, sustained. We have our own armor. We have pilots that drive us around. Um, we have our corpsmen, we're, we're self-sustained, we bring everything with us. So we're able to, uh, to maintain a facility for a good, you know, month or two. Um, so that's basically what we do. We do a lot of close course battle training. We have snipers on the team. Um, we all cross train in, in different things, breaching, uh, things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty self-sustained that, that can be for deployed and you know enforce the security force that's already in place be it for the most part at their embassies yeah sounds like similar to like a SWAT team law enforcement or something right right exactly um uh so you said you deployed to Bahrain that was your first deployment right what was that like so it was awesome uh, so being in Bahrain we basically we shoot a lot we do a lot of training um, we were fortunate enough, we had a SEAL team that lived with us, so we kind of did their morning PT, calisthenics, pool drills, and then at night time, well, we shoot during the day most of the time, and then uh, at night we hit the weight room, <laughs> and then I was a lot bigger than I am now, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think I was walking around 200 pounds in, um, and then we just train, that's all we do, shoot, move, and communicate. Uh, where is Bahrain at for just for those who don't know? So Bahrain is an island off the coast, uh, off the east coast of Saudi Arabia. So I was deployed out there. Um, unfortunately, during that time was the USS coal bombing in, in Yemen. So when that we were actually running an operation in Africa, when Yemen broke out, we were there a little less than 24 hours. Um, so we enforced the embassy, the hospital. And then the actual USS Cole itself that was, uh, wasn't able to move out of port. So they were, uh, the sailors were holding their own security for a while. 
or for you know for a bit before we got there and then uh we took over the ship because obviously there's a there was a full it's a destroyer so all their uh, personnel was still on board um they were sleeping on, on top of the decks at the time because obviously that you know big hole inside of their ship so uh yeah we got we got to run that mission for uh did you them. did you get to, um did you get any spend any um time off in Saudi Arabia or are you getting any time off while you're out there no that was pretty much work I mean when we were in Bahrain we got liberty there so we got to to party there's actually a a stewardess school out there at least there was um so the nightlife there is it's it's pretty cool it's basically the a lot of people call it the Las Vegas of the Middle East because they, <laughs> they serve alcohol and things like that so uh yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, foreign military members there. Not too much, but then uh, there's a lot of civilian companies that, that hold their yeah. headquarters there. Uh, you know, what what type of shit do do, do Marines get into, man, in, in Bob fucking Rain? <laughs> man, Bob Rain. Uh, so I didn't know this till I joined the Mew years later, but ships actually docked there. So when, when ships docked there, we did not go out at all because it was just unnecessary. Uh, a lot of shenanigans for sure. But uh, yeah, so the, for us, like I said, I can remember times where, so the Navy SEALs aren't as big as the fast team. We were about 20 or so deep. Uh, there was only, if I can recall correctly, I don't know, maybe about 15 SEALs or so. Um, yeah, I think those guys, great guys. You know, I'm still friends with some of them. They uh, they like getting into it, man. At least, you know, being young SEALs, they go out there and, and live it up. And then they see us and they're like, all right. I can remember this one particular time. There was about four of them. We had just walked in. And they're like, hey, how many is there of you guys? And I was like, oh, I think it's about yeah, seven of us. Hell yeah, there's ten of us. Come on. And we're like, come on. And we already knew this This isn't going good. And they just ran straight to the back, started fighting. Of course, we're not going to let our boys go at it alone. Um, I think there were a bunch of Brits, and we just kind of got into it, <laughs> took care of business, ran out of there. And then we ended up partying somewhere else that night, man. Where were you guys in a, a bar or something? Yeah, it was a bar. Uh. Yeah. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not putting them off as bad guys like i say they're great guys and we weren't angels either um sometimes some of our guys started fights that they shouldn't have and then they were there to back us up so that's basically how the deployment went yeah. until uh you know we got shipped to yemen and <laughs> that, that ended everything i mean that's what the fuck marines like to do when they go out to a bar they have to fucking find trouble man and that's that's the problem man <laughs> <laughs> as an older guy i can say that yeah. Right at, at the time, it was, you know, we were living it up, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, how long did you stay in Bahrain? So my deployment was for six months. So uh, I might have stayed a little over, if I can recall. Like I said, Yemen kind of threw a wrench in, into the thing. We were in Yemen for a bit till we were relieved by the Mew. And then uh, we went back to Bahrain, packed up, and then went back to Virginia. Mm. Um, and then, uh, what, what happened from there? What'd you do from there? I remember going home cause I hadn't been home in over a year. I uh, went home on leave, you know, saw my old friends. Uh, unfortunately I remember I, I went to a few funerals of, uh, guys that I grew up with, you know, from the neighborhood that were killed. I went and visit them in the cemetery that, you know, a lot of my high school buddies, you know, took me to that I later found out that were killed. Um, you know, just doing gang life stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. So once I, uh, I left home from leave, I went home, I went back to, um, when I was going back to the Marines, I got shipped out to uh, Iceland. Mm. So I was stationed in Iceland for a while with the security force company out there, Keflavik Iceland. Yeah. What was life like in Iceland? To be honest, man, it was a lot of fun. I, th I honestly think about that place probably at least once a day. <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. It was a NATO base, so there's, we're the only Marines there. Um, we had our own bar there, the, the Mar Bar. 
where you know we got to bring people in um unless you knew marine you weren't getting in there so it's kind of that you know special kind of place because you couldn't just walk in um we brought some icelandic folks there and you know they loved it man it was it was a great time there there was some tough times i'm not gonna lie growing up in la being hispanic you know being mexican i don't uh i don't uh take too kindly to cold weather but you got that in spades there man there's a lot of cold weather training climbing glaciers um doing snow caves things like that like again i'm a, I'm a mexican kid from the inner city never expecting to to go through these experiences and, that, and that's some of what the marine corps gave me um experiences and yeah cold weather training is it was no fun for me i did not like it then now i look back on it with with a special place in my heart for sure but uh yeah it, it gets tough down there man some hardcore people live up there for sure what do you think uh going through that type of training uh did for you um it, it does a lot because it, it not only makes you feel i didn't think i was made of glass because of where i grew up and the way i grew up but there were some times where you know in the marine corps absolutely helps in this where it just there's no quit in you you know what i mean you, you can't quit because out there what's interesting about cold weather training is you have to do five things to do one thing meaning out here in california where i live now I can just go to my pack and open something and then grab it and I'm good, right? Be it a, a snack or something to drink or whatever. But out there, I have to, you know, climb through snow, take my outer gloves off, maybe even my inner gloves off. The way you pack your pack, you know, when you're climbing like that is you usually got the stuff you're going to need, like your ropes, you know, your first aid kit, your water, your thick pack if you stop for too long you want to put this big jacket on uh, you got to move all that stuff off to get to you know whatever it is your little little scooby snack that you want to grab you open that up you scarf it down and then you got to put everything back the way it's supposed to be because you know it's a system and everyone's pack is like that for safety reasons then you put your gloves back on your outer gloves back on and then you know you go back to wherever spot you were at um, so it's a lot of work, even heating up food. You got to melt ice because out there, you know, you're gone for weeks at a time. So, you know, you got to melt ice, which for those of you who never melted ice before, it takes a lot of ice to make, you know, a little bit of water um, to get hot enough to cook your food in. And then you eat chow and you got to put everything back the way it's supposed to go. So it's it's a lot of work. It helps you be organized. Definitely helps you uh, be disciplined, but for sure helps you appreciate, you know, your life wherever you live. Because sure as hell ain't as cold as Iceland, mm -hmm. and you're not climbing a glacier. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a you can't pay. You have to pay attention. Like, you know, we talked about it earlier off camera, where it's, you know, there's some things you can do that you can go on autopilot. But when you're out there, you know, in the elements, you got to stay focused, you know, you got to, you know, we did a lot of climbing, a lot of rappelling, a lot of climbing with ice axes, things like that, that very few people get to do. Um, you got to stay sharp, you know, you got to stay, you know, connected to everyone's always on a rope system because there's a lot of crevasses and things like that on glaciers. So, uh, yeah, you got to stay sharp to keep yourself safe and your team safe. So... Mm -hmm. Sounds like a lot of shit where any little mistake it might get you hurt. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you break your leg out there, you're two, three days walk away from from transportation. So, uh, you know, you're screwed. And then now I have to rely on my mates to, to help, you know, get me back there eventually, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah. Um, where did you go from, uh, from Iceland? So after Iceland, I went home again because I hadn't been home in a year and a half. Unfortunately, out there, I broke my collarbone in training. And uh, so I was out of commission for a few months. So I got extended. And then, uh, which was not a bad place to uh, to get hurt. Um, I could, talking about that injury for a second. Um, that injury is pretty tough because I had to wear this harness that 
pulls my shoulders back, but I almost had no use of my right arm. So I had a, you know, I couldn't dress myself, couldn't tie my own shoes, couldn't buckle my belt. I had a girlfriend at the time who was a huge help to me and as well as my, you know, my Marine buddies who come over a lot, help me out, cook for me. Um, I have a lot of fun uh, place in my heart for, for those guys. Um, they looked after me when I had no family. You know, they were my family. And like most veterans know when you're out there uh, overseas, you know, you can have the most amazing family. But, you know, without your mates, you, it's pretty hard to get through. So uh, that injury taught me a lot and humbled me up a lot because I was, I felt like I was, you know, unbreakable for a long mm -hmm. time until you get broken and then you're like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get humbled up real quick. But How, uh, How'd you, uh, how'd you break it? Uh, honestly, I don't remember. I don't. I think I fell off of something, or I probably did something I shouldn't have. To, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. Um, yeah. So after that, I hadn't been home in a while. Went home again on leave. Hung out with my buddies. Had a great time. Um, from there, I went to uh, I joined Second Battalion, Second Marines, out of uh, Lejeune. So that's where I went after to do my infantry stuff. Where is that? Out of Camp Lejeune, uh, North Carolina. Yeah. 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 Um, so what was it like for you transitioning over there? Yeah. So the the going back to the Fleet Marine Force FMF, man, that was it was a trip. I still remember this. Uh, it was one of my first field exercises. You know, I was a new guy. They didn't know me. I didn't know them, and uh, I'm a West considered a West Coast guy, right? And these are all East Coast Marines. And we went through one of our first training uh, ops. I think it was four or five days long. And, uh, you know, I met some of the guys. Some of the guys were cool. Some of the guys not so cool. Whatever it is, what it is. Those are Marines for you. And uh, I, I look at this very fondly because um, I'll get into it in a second. But I'll just tell a story. Just, like, kind of let it pan itself out. Um, one of these guys comes over, real nice guy, and he goes, hey, Gasca, um, you know, just so you know, bro, no hard feelings, but these guys are going to jump you. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, man, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna jump you here in a couple minutes, man. I'm just letting you know. And he kind of says it nonchalantly, he walks off, right? And I haven't been jumped since I was, fuck, I think 14. I've been jumped maybe about three times my whole life. Two of the times they thought I was someone else, so go figure, right? <laughs> And uh, so I was like, jump me. Like, and then I'm thinking back to the neighborhood, right? Like, I'm going to get kicked in the head and all kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Getting tooth busted out. And I'm like, well, fuck this. I'm like, I ain't no punk, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, it is what it is. Took my watch off. And a guy who came over, I met him, my, my boy Anthony Epperson. You know him too. We yeah. all met in security for school, right, back yeah. in the day. And he goes, hey, you want backup, dude? And I'm like, nah, man. Like, I mean, if I'm getting stomped out, yeah, I jump in. But I don't want you there from, like, the beginning, right? I don't want them to think I can't handle it. And he's like, all right, cool, man. This is what it is. I'm like, all right. So then I sat back and I started seeing him circle around. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I never will forget when my middle brother, Arturo, told me, he goes, if you ever get jumped again, this is when I was a kid, right? He goes, just make one guy pay for it. It is. What's going to happen is going to happen. But make one dude pay for it, man. I'm like, I never forgot that advice. So here I was. I picked my one dude. My mistake having to be one of the toughest motherfuckers there, right? <laughs> but I didn't know. I didn't really know anyone. So then uh, they come out, man. They start punching me. I start punching back. I grab that one dude. I take him down. I stay on him. And they called him Papa, right? Because he was older than, than all of us. Mm. And he starts yelling, get the fuck back. Just get back. So he pulls them all off. And it was a one-on-one -on -one thing. So we go at it. And he turns out to be one of the best dudes I met on deployment, being part of 2-2. Um, great dude. He was like an older brother to all of us, man. Great guy. Michael Spear, man. Rest in peace. He passed away in, um, in Iraq. And um, anyway, so after that day, you know, we went at it like dogs. 
and later on he comes over, he used to smoke cigars. He brought me cigars, I didn't smoke cigars then, I, I said no, I'm good. And he goes, no, I'm like, you're gonna smoke this cigar with me. I'm like, all right. So we were already back home in our barracks and it was just him and I and he starts talking he goes, man, that was a good fight, huh? And I was like, yeah, that was, was a good scrap. So we started to get to know each other. He was from Tennessee, you know, small town, also in the inner city of LA. And, uh, you know, we connected on, on a cool level, you know, and later on we ended up deploying together. But, um, yeah, man, solid guys. I'll never yeah. forget that story, man. That was your, was that your initi initiation to the fleet? Or Correct, what? yeah, that was my uh, initiation to a Fox company, 2-2, uh, two Hilo company, man. <laughs> it, was, it was a trip. Yeah, I, re I remembered, fuck, you guys were just on the other side of the fuck, at the back of the barracks, the same barracks, mm -hmm. right? We were, yeah, 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 yeah. So it was Golf Company, Echo Company, which was Boat. Yeah. Um, you guys were Track, right? We were or? Boat. Boat, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had Boat Company, yeah. Echo, I think, was Track. Yeah. And Fox Company was Hill Company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, by this time, you know, uh, I know we'll get into this, um, you know, at, at some point in this interview, but um, had you already been training jujitsu? No, so just the basic, um, basic stuff that you learn from the Marines. I think they call it. I forgot what they call it, but they have like a belt system, you know, yeah, like gray, yeah. oh, green yeah. belt, and all that. Okay. So yeah, just basic stuff. At that point, it was just like not wanting to get your ass beat, man. That's all that was, you know. Yeah. yeah. School, schoolyard stuff. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's your initiation. I, I, I imagine you know you started again respect after that, you know as time went on and right that, um and then you know what'd you get into after that were you um so after uh after that we did our spin up for deployment and then we joined the uh, 24th mew and we deployed we stopped back at bahrain again uh i visited an old girlfriend for a couple of days and then uh <laughs> went back on boat and we deployed to iraq so we uh we linked up with Task Force Tarwa during the uh, initial push of the Iraq War. Now, what was like? What was that like for you? Um, and to me, that was a big old video game. To be honest, like it felt initially. Uh, I still remember a good buddy of mine came up to me. He goes, "Hey, Gasca, you scared, man?" I'm like, I looked at him and like, oh, that was a silly question. I'm like. Fuck yeah, I'm scared, dude. Like, you been in war? And he's like, no, like, I won't mean either. He goes, yeah, I'm kind of scared. I'm like, me too, man. But as long as we take care of each other, um, take care of our guys, we'll, we'll be all right. You know, and, and I, I said that because I meant it. I truly meant it. Uh, I didn't know if we were going to walk out of there, but I knew I was going to, I was going to put my best foot forward. I was going to take care of my guys, you know, whether patrolling or cover fire or direct fire, what have you, I was going to put my best foot forward and we were going to come back one way or another. Right. That's, that's how I saw. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what kind of things, what was the culture like over there, man, in Iraq and the combat environment? Um, you know, what type of things did you see? Or, um, um, yeah. So obviously being an infantry guy, you know, you're there in the mix, especially in the initial push. So what I remember most about the Iraq war is, is how often we were moving. Um, you know, you watch war movies and they dig in and they're kind of hanging out for a few days or they have a base and some tents have beer and all that bullshit. We didn't have any of that shit. Um, obviously, you were there with me. But uh, yeah, man, I, rem I remember moving a lot. We dig. I remember the first probably three or four fighting holes I dug. And for the audience, a fighting hole is basically a, a defensive position. You sit in there, you make a little grenade hole in case something, your perimeter gets overran. And, um, you know, you can make them to whatever your style is, right? You can have a little cool box, and then you have your pack on one side, you organize it nice and neat. Um, you got your intersecting field to fire basically with the other fighting hole to make sure that your perimeters is complete and secure. So I remember the first three or four I made were like really nice, man, textbook. My, my uh, instructors would be very proud. 
but then we kept moving around so much and I was like, man, this takes too much work. So if you look at my fighting hole from the first few weeks <laughs> to, you know, three, four months down the line, you, you weren't very impressed towards the end. <laughs> um, but I mean, we were tired, you know, we were beat. Um, yeah, the combat aspect, you know, I'm not some like super religious guy, but I, I feel I am, I, I have God in my heart. Um, I believe in him. Um, I believe he looked out for me. I believe he looked out for my mates. Uh, I pray every night. I go to church when I can. I, uh, my, my son knows Jesus. Um, so it, it's a kind of a weird thing in that aspect. Because you're there doing what you're told, what you feel is right. And you protect your guys. And I don't, I don't regret any of it. Um, but yeah, it does affect you. You know, you, you do things that you're not, it's not normal for the most of the population to go through. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I, I, I think of it. It was, it was a tough time for sure. You see the best of, of people and you see the worst of people. Mm. I seen selfless acts of people like I might get shot right now but I'm going to do it because my team needs it. And I've also seen, you know, people do some gnarly stuff to where you're like, shit, I, I hope that guy years from now is, is all right. Cause you know, what he just had to do. So yeah. War, war is an interesting place that you, you, you see extremes, you know, you see how, how good of a heart someone has, and then you also see what one human being is capable of doing or another. And that's, you know, it's kind of a, a wake up for sure. Um, earlier, when you were telling that story about the, the initiation fight, um, uh, you mentioned that you lost uh, your buddy in right. Iraq. Is that during this deployment right here? No, so that, that was after the deployment afterward. Um, I was, I guess, would you be considered senior? So, um, by the time I got out, uh, a lot of my junior Marines were still in. So they deployed like, maybe a year after, if not a little less, uh, during that time, I'm still in contact with a lot of my Marines. Um, yeah, they, they hit me up and, you know, they told me, Hey, uh, spear got killed by a sniper. Um, which was devastating because, again, he was older than, than all of us. Um, he, he was a leader for sure, right? You know, just a just strong, corn-fed dude from Tennessee, man. And, and he cared about you, you know, he cared about his guys. And this was his or well, their second deployment out there. And, um, yeah, sniper got him. And then that was hard news for me already being back in the world. Um, but for these guys that were still out there, still had months left in their deployment. Um, I, I've talked to a great number of them afterward. And, you know, it's basically you, you look at him like he's our guy, right? Like we're going to get through the worst of this stuff with him. And then when he's killed, um, it's kind of like shit, you know, like, how I said that some of these guys talked um, to me about it, where they're like, they they knew they're like, I'm not as good as Marine as him, and if they can kill him, then what can they do to me? And then that like that fear kicks in, and I mean you know that's that's the worst thing you could have in a firefight is is that that paralyzing fear, because it it can stop you from reacting the way you want. You know the way you're trained and for the most part marines you know work through it and get through it and and perform but uh yeah, it just makes the fight different you know every every gun fight's different you don't get to you can fucking kick ass one day and then on a tuesday and then the following saturday you're like shit i should have done better you know um but yeah that's that's how he was killed um so you got out uh, after your first four years, right? Yeah. Um, what was it like, you know, after having been through all that, 
um, all the experiences, all the things that you've experienced in the Marines, good and bad. What was it like transitioning back into civilian life for you? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting story because, um, so when I got out, I honest, I felt my whole life was in the Marines. Like, you grow up there so fast, especially during war and all that, right, and training. Um, you almost don't remember your childhood so much because um, it changes you, right? And how I said earlier, I, I grew up without my old man, but when I got back, um, I just wanted to be around my old man. And luckily he was there. Like I knew him, I, I did not know him. He just didn't, like he wasn't part of my life. He didn't live with us. Mm -hmm. um, but now he was, and you know, I'd been out of my mom's home since I was 17. Now I was, I was uh, 21. And it, it was interesting. I remember getting home from the airport and I was maybe five feet away from my mom. She didn't recognize me. I was a lot thinner. I was really dark. Um, yeah, I just, that kind of broke my heart, you know. And I'm sure she didn't mean anything by it. She just, I mean, I just physically looked different. And uh, God bless my family. There was a lot of them there. I, I probably had about, I don't know, 15, 20 family members there at the airport. I got in really late, like, past midnight or something. Um, yeah, so I uh, said hi to my family, and I remember seeing my, my father there, and I was like, man, it's like, I hugged him, and he told me, hey, I'm, I'm glad you're home. And uh, it was just a, like a different feeling, right? Maybe because I didn't grow up with it, didn't recognize it. I don't know what you would call it. But um, yeah, I, I remember it because the next day, and, I, and I've told this story to friends before. The following day, my first day out of the Marine Corps was my loneliest day of my life. Lonely. Because if you could imagine, I mean, you know, but for the audience, you have legit like 250 friends, like really good friends that would do anything for you, right? Brothers. They would, they would fight for you. They would stab somebody for you, shoot somebody for you, like true mates. And then one day they're gone. That's. That's like it's reality, right? Like mm -hmm. here I was in North Carolina and people left like different days, right? So we would all go with them in the airport. And then the next day, so-and-so's leaving, so-and-so's leaving, so-and-so's leaving. We would all go to the airport and take them. And then it worked its way down there until the day that I left. I think I had seven, eight guys versus the first guys that initially left had like 30, right? Or whatever. And then slowly started dwindling down. I gave them all a hug, told them I loved them. And then I flew back to LA. And that next day, I'll never forget, I woke up in my brother's room. I was sleeping on the ground. Um, I mean, there wasn't room for me. And he was gone at work. My sister has gone at school. My mom's at work. And then it was just this weird silence. You open your eyes and you're like, all right, what do you do now, right? You had all your mates before, you go PT together, eat chow together, what have you. You know, I brush my gaiters, I walk downstairs, my old man's there. And I'm like, again, someone that I knew but didn't know. But I was, I was glad he was there. Um, so that, that was like a big thing because I, I had to think, right? I had to be on my feet. Like, what do we do now? We, meaning myself, like, mm. it was just me. You know, life goes on. People got jobs. People got to go to school. Um, yeah, I remember that, that hitting home pretty hard. And I was like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, fuck it. I'm going on a run. Got PT, right? Kind of help deal with all this. And, uh, so my father passed away of cancer uh, two months ago. Mm. And uh, <laughs> so on his deathbed, um, 
you know, I, I closed his ear and I was like, hey, um, do you remember when you were there for me? When I got back from Iraq, he's like, yeah. I just told him, like, yeah, I appreciate that. Because, yeah, he wasn't there for me as a kid or whatever. Um, but uh, in my opinion, he was there when I needed him most. Because during that time, I needed him most. And, uh, yeah, we hung out for, like, five, five two, three months, man. He was there every day. We'd wake up, we'd go on walks together. I'd go pee. He's a lot older. He he was, uh, he passed away uh, at 84. Um, and then I'd go on my runs, work out, whatever. And uh, yeah, it was cool because I, like, I got to know him during that time. And uh, man, he lived a rough life too, you know. Yeah. And uh, but it was cool because, like, I spoke to other family members, not in detail about things. And they were just different. Like, in a way, they judge you. Whatever it is, what it is, you're not going to change them. Um, but one thing I, I remember about my old man, never judge me. And I was pretty open with him than most. And he's like, cool, like, you're here now and... You know, live your life and stuff. You know, you're old, old school Mexican guy. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that to be there for me, you know, from when, when I, not that I was down, but I was hurting. And I think he, he knew that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it's good that you got a chance to, to, to talk to him like that, man. And, yeah, you know, for sure. Sorry to hear about your pop. I mean, obviously, I already know about that, right. but, you know, uh, it still fucking sucks to hear it. So, yeah. Sorry about that, man. Um, uh, let's shift it over, man. Let's talk about uh, you know some of the stuff you're doing now. You, you know, you 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 train jujitsu. Um, you know, you run this uh, nonprofit called Fighting Hole Jujitsu. You know, tell me a little bit about that, uh, what you're doing, and why you're doing it. Obviously, like most veterans, they they kind of find something that that they like or they can help them cope with things. Uh, for me, surfing and uh, jujitsu are, are those two things. Obviously, the, the birth of my son a few years ago was, was a big change too. But with surfing and jujitsu, I felt it made me a better person. I'm, I'm definitely a nicer person than I was when I first got out of the military. Um, I don't let things bother me as much. But from the jujitsu aspect, um, I love it because it, cause it's hard. It's not easy to be good at it. It takes a lot of practice. Um, a lot of things that the military teaches you, like you need your partners, right? No one does jujitsu by themselves. Uh, it's impossible. Um, it helps you focus, right? Like you need to be in the moment in jujitsu. Because if you're not, you're going to get smashed, period. I don't care how good you are. Um, if you're not thinking moves ahead, thinking how I'm going to get out of this really tough situation, if I don't breathe properly, I'm not going to make it out or I'll get submitted, right? Um, so it's helped me a lot, personally. Um, and obviously suicide is a huge problem for veterans. I've personally, as a I've lost seven uh, friends to suicide. And during this time, um, my last good buddy of mine, uh, Adam Collier, he was a, uh, a major with uh, 4th Recon. He ran the 4th Reconnaissance Battalion. Um, when he took his life, it was kind of like, kind of an awakening, right? Because... You know, some guys, you kind of get it. They're suffering or they were having problems getting a job, things like that, um, which is, it's, it's hard. But my buddy Adam kind of had it all, had everything. You know what I mean? At least we thought, me and his friends. Um, so when that happened, I was like, man, like, here's a guy who had a lot of things going for him, very smart guy, very successful. Um, 
like I was just tired of it. And I was like, well, what can I do to help? Sure, I've volunteered, you know, I've gone to hospitals and volunteered and things like that. But what can I, like, what can I bring forward to the veteran community that one can be taught, can be duplicated, and, and like, that'll make me happy, right? And make other people happy. And that's how Fighting Hole Jiu-Jitsu came up. So basically, um, for those that do Jiu-Jitsu or don't do it, it's basically ground grappling techniques using leverage, timing, um, and things like that. Um, it, it's an expensive sport. It is. You know, you'll pay a few hundred dollars a month to, to do it. And to be honest, a lot of people can't afford that. So what Fighting Hole Jiu-Jitsu does is... I have myself and a lot of world-class instructors, you know, former strike force fighters, UFC fighters that teach jujitsu for free. Mm. So we get together at least once, twice a month, um, have that camaraderie that you had in the military, had a lot of like-minded individuals that have gone through things that you've gone through that understand you, that at least understand the struggle. And we come in and we teach you guys. It's all different levels from super advanced to very beginners. And we'll sit down with you and, you know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with taking medication and all that, but there's none of that here. It's plain old man contact to teaching you a skill to help you defend yourself, protect your family, help you get in shape. Um, encompasses all those things and it's, it's just one-on-one -on -one contact man it's 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 not going to be easy we're not there beating you up or nothing like i said there's different levels but when you show up you're, you're going to sweat um, you're going to put your best foot forward just like you did in war and then you know when you when you walk out of that there uh you'll be a better person for it i promise you mm. is it just for combat vets or just or any vets? no so it's all <laughs> veterans Okay. Uh, not just combat at all. Any veteran come, we have Coast Guard guys, Army guys, um, Marine guys, you know, Air Force guys. Every everyone comes out, males, females. Awesome. Um, you you come out and train, and uh, we provide you know the, the environment for you to get through it. We sponsor athletes. Uh, the nonprofit will get you know will sponsor you and get you into a, a competition because I feel that's where you learn a lot. Um, military people in general are, are pretty competitive and you know we go there we support you and uh, we hope that you bring in those tools to you know to other aspects of your life definitely nice. that's cool man that's awesome um, we're getting ready to wrap it up man uh, but before I do I'd like to give everyone the opportunity to say any last words you know before we cut the tape uh, right um, no, first, thanks for having me here, bud. I, I appreciate it. We're, we're longtime friends. Uh, yeah. I know we worked on a while to, to make this happen. Um, I just want to say to those veterans out there, they're listening to every veteran's story. Um, you're important. You have something to say. You have something to give to the world. Whatever that is, whatever skill it is, it might just be an ear or, or an embrace to not only another veteran, but to your family. So I just want to say personally to take care of yourselves, right? Continue being strong mentally, physically, take care of your families. Cause you know, the, they're the ones who are going to pick you up off the ground, which I'm sure they've already done before. And they'll continue to mm -hmm. with no uh, hesitation or, or judgment. So take care of yourself, take care of each other. And, uh, if you guys ever want to come out, findingholejujitsu.com is our website. Uh, we're on Instagram, findingholejj, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys on the mats. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Jose, man. I appreciate it. You're my fucking brother, and uh, it's a big contribution for you to come and sit down and tell your story, man. So I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way, I'm coming back home. Long dirt road, I'm